winter going on, so it makes it feel a little bit more festive and Christmassy, and you get me again today. So, yes, I figured with the season being what it is, magical and, you know, all the miracles going on, you've got stories about miracles, the miracle of Christmas itself, right? Uh, I thought that this would be a good time to talk about a subject that is my most favorite subject, which is angels. And specifically, we're going to talk about guardian angels and angels that... um, interact with us daily. A little bit of background for those of you who don't know, I've been studying angels. Now it's going to be about 20 years. I started when I first taught angel things, it had been five years before, so it had been 15, but now 20. And the reason that I got into it is because I'd always had these little experiences and um, have always been fascinated by them. And then I would see things they would show on TV and I'd be like, Gabriel's not like that. Ew. You know, or, (laughs) I mean, Michael, really? A womanizer? Huh. Not so sure about that. You know, John Travolta, those of you who saw that movie. Yeah. You know, and so I really started digging deep into it and uh, would tell my father about it because I was raised Catholic. And being raised Catholic, we, there's some bits and pieces of that religion that I kept and really liked. And one of those was always talking to angels and saints and things like that because they interacted so much and it's just part of the religion and who they are. So when I started talking to my dad about them, he was like, oh, well, you know, the Bible's not the only thing that has stuff about angels. And I was like, really? So then for Christmas, because I love to read, like almost borderline sickness reading type thing, (laughs) everything, right? Um, He bought me a book that was the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so I started reading and it was just all the bits and pieces. Now that is not an easy read because there's like these little bits and pieces that are not full. So then your brain is trying to fill in the gaps, but I got the gist of it. And there's really a lot of mystical and angelic things that occurred within that. So I started really meditating and praying, and I think I did that for about five years, really, before I finally had, like, a true encounter that I thought, you know, ooh, it's an angel. And um, then after that, more and more and more and more, to the point of where now, if I don't, like, shield myself a little bit, I could see, like, all of them, or, you know, and their energy. So some of them appear in different ways and, you know, shapes and forms. And we'll talk about that. But in my experience that I had had was my guardian angel. And I had just been praying and I thought, you know, why, why don't you just like come and talk to me, right? And uh, so in that experience that I was in, this angel shows up looking like a gladiator Because, see, they tend to show up also in ways that you'll accept their look. So apparently, mine was Brad Pitt. Not that I really have a big old crush on him, because I don't really like Brad Pitt, but that's just what came to mind. So I um, refer to him as Brad, because he still hasn't given me his name, and I'll explain that a little later. So the experience, though, was not fun, Like, I was thinking when I would have, like, an experience with an angel, it would be all, like, lovey and, you know, like, um, what was that movie with Michael Landon? Highway to Heaven, right? All, you know, oh, he loves me. No. He immediately began to attack me in a way that was like when someone's trying to teach someone how to fight, right? So he'd come at me, and he, he was standing there, and he had a sword and shield, and he threw them at me, and I was like, what am I supposed to do with that? He's like, defend yourself. And I was like, wait, 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 wait. This is not how it's supposed to be. But before I could go any further on, the attack was coming and I had no choice but to keep, you know, doing these defense moves and running and doing all this weird stuff. And I'm like, why are you attacking me? Are you mad? You know, have I been that bad a kid? Because, you know, some guardian angels, I think, get driven to drink because of the charges that they have. (laughs) And I know I definitely had some moments, but at this time of my life, I was going through a lot of struggles. There was financial struggle. There was, I had a little bit of a crisis of faith. I think it was when I was really starting to awaken and I was starting to doubt 
my ability to use my gifts and see and hear the things that I was seeing and hearing. And so what he was doing was he was teaching me how to not let my thoughts attack me and come against me and other people's words and how to deflect and shield from them. And then from that point on, um, <clears throat> I believe once he was satisfied, I'd learned, uh, kind of sort of left me alone and I just kind of came out of the experience like, wow, I hope the next time he's nicer, you know, <laughs> and he has been. And from that point on, I've had some other angel visitations and I have different angels that come and, you know, help me with certain things like dancing. I have one that helps me with dancing, coming up with dances. I have one that helps me with writing, teaching. And because now, the type of creatures that they are, once you show an interest in them, they've always been interested in us. But guardian angels aside, they don't interfere with our free will without our asking, just like God. So I thought, well, I've had a lot of questions, people asking me about angels, and uh, thought, well, here we go. Tis the season, right? So, and not that the spirit realm isn't always open for us. It just seems that around this time of year, we pay closer attention because we have all the stories, you know, those miracle stories that you hear where it just isn't possible that the person survived or it just isn't possible, you know, whatever. Money showing up under a rock, things like that, you know. And we're just more aware of it at this time, I think, because there's just something magical about the whole nativity birth story and just how that unfolded as well. So this is like one of the best times, I think, if you haven't interacted with your angels or if you want to interact with more because your guardian angel is getting a little boring, is a good time to start doing that. So angels, there's a lot. <laughs> There's a lot. Over all these years I've been doing studying, I'm like, oh my gosh. And you can get overwhelmed with the information that's there. So angels and guardian angels are the angels that are closest to us, meaning they interact more interchangeably between the spirit and physical realm. And you know the story about beware who you entertain because you could be entertaining an angel. Yeah, they sometimes do look like a human for a reason we don't know. You know, and will come in and help you, give you the words of wisdom for whatever you need in that moment, and then bam, they're gone. And you're like, hmm, that's interesting. And I've heard many different stories from people within our community that have had those experiences, and then even, you know, myself and other family members and things. So they interact with us interchangeably. And most times it's one on one because, well, we get overwhelmed. Because not all angels look like we think. They are energy. So they can basically form themselves and look any way that they want. And I think that for many of us, if we were to actually see some of their true, actual, like, here's how I look, it's too much for our physical brain to take. And so we may not take the message that they have to say. So they're very, very um, aware of that and gentle with it when it comes to us. I mean, we, we had some experiences here where I think uh, Laurie saw one was going around touching people, making them laugh, and she swore he looked like Friar Tuck. And all he did was make people laugh, and he just laughed. So his purpose was joy, obviously, and that's how she saw him, and he put himself out there because it was probably more acceptable than whatever, you know, light there is. You know, and sometimes, sometimes you ever have that little flash of light, and you're walking, and, it's like, and you're all, that could be it, you know? And there's darker ones too, of course, but we're not going to talk about them. <laughs> so a guardian angel, the word guardian, obviously, it's pretty cut and dry there, right? Somebody who guards, somebody who watches over, somebody who guides. Um, our guardian angel, we are specifically assigned one that decides to watch over us before we come out. It's kind of like one of those unspoken things, you know, we're getting ready to come down and an angel will step forward and be like, okay, I will help you. So it's a, an agreement that we make with them. And the moment we're born, they're there. And uh, it's even, I mean, we have one scripture that I want to point out is Psalm 91:11. 
He'll command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. So it's there. And they have jobs to do and things to do. And Judeo-Christian and Jewish religions are not the only ones that recognize some type of angelic being. So it's important to know that this just isn't something that we're just like, oh, just this group of people has angels or just this group can identify them or whatever. No, there are many, many others. And so I went in some of my... Um, the word just went right out of my mouth, uh, studies of the angels, uh, I found that um, starting way back even to before Jesus, there was a religion um, outside of Jewish religion that has been recognized as one of the oldest monotheistic religions um, that was around 559 B.C., and was really, really strong and in power till about 651 AC, meaning that sudden, you know, the Christ teaching became more powerful than this. But they were believers in one entity, one divine being, and angels were part of that. And it was called Zoostenarium. I can't even, I don't know if I said that right, but yes. So it's way, way back. And then you have um, Buddhism. Buddhism refers to angels as divas, or they just call them celestial beings that basically do the same thing. The same thing. Um, Hinduism, they refer to them as spiritual beings of light. Again, that you contact with that do the same thing that your angels do, that your guardian angels do. Even Islam. Islam has angels as one of the six pillars of their belief in their religious doctrine. So angels are very, very real, and they are beings that exist out of time, out of space, and they can shimmy back and forth um, in the spiritual realm. Like we can, except they do it a little more often and they spend a little bit more time in the spiritual realm. So your angelic guardian angel, once they've stepped forward to um, say that they're going to help you through this physical life and this physical world that we live, they take on their duty to guide, protect, support you, help you with your soul path, your purpose, help you expand your mind, and keep your authentic self in truth. So a lot of times, some of those dropped in thoughts that we have are angels putting something in because for some reason we're ignoring the divine voice. And sometimes that's easy to do because we forget you know, we get out of, you know, practice, doing our uh, meditating or praying or whatever we do, and, and, and suddenly the divine voice just kind of retreats, and we forget, or we just get busy. And because our angels are interacting so much more, uh, they can sometimes step in and say, hey, uh, what about this? Um, I do remember there was a time when uh, I was traveling with my daughter, and um, it was late at night. We were coming back from a place that we'd been, and I had gone to switch lanes. And I mean, I'm going, what, 70, 70 miles an hour on the highway, right? And I go to switch lanes, and there's a car that had just come up on my blind spot. It had been black, whatever. I did not see it, right? And I caught it, but it freaked me out, even though it had moved over or whatever, and I lost some control of my car. Now, your first instinct is to slam on the brake. And generally, when you slam on the brake, that is not good, especially when you're going 70 miles an hour and you are, you know, um, in a panic and out of control. And all I got in my mind was do not hit the brakes. So I just took my foot off the gas and I just did my best to let the car slow down on its own and get it back in line where it needed to be. Now that was not a rational thought that I was having <laughs> because all the thoughts that were going through my mind is I have my 16 year old daughter next to me, myself, and she's awakened from sleep. So she's kind of disoriented and yelling a little bit. I'm trying to keep 
the road and I'm thinking if we flip, you know, all these things are going through my mind and that just bam. And it was a feeling that I knew and recognized and a voice and honestly believe that because of that, I'm here today and so is she because I think it would have been a pretty bad rollover if uh, I had tried to slam on the brake. So they also guide when you are, you know, trying to come up with your thesis or something simple, you know, and suddenly a thought will pop in your mind. And we'll talk, we'll talk about how to, you know, recognize them and do that before we close. So they have very distinct jobs to do to help you on your way and agreements with you as well where they're going to help you. Because remember, if they can exist outside of time, they can go see something in the future and be like, oh, um, I don't think they agreed to that choice there, so I'm going to just come back over to this present moment and prod them a little bit <laughs> to go this way, you know, because sometimes we get caught up in the present and we forget what we're doing and who we are and boom. Suddenly we're like, how did I get here? What did I make that decision for? Oh, because you didn't listen to the first five times that you were given all these different signs and things to go this way, go this way. But we're stubborn and we have our own minds and so we just kind of do what we're going to do. And they still respect that. But um, guardian angels have a little more freedom because we gave them that authority before birth. Whereas other angels, before they start interacting with you, they will wait for you to... Um, hey, I know you're there. <laughs> they won't just start interfering unless you ask in that way. Um, another thing about your guardian angel is they know everything about you. So I want to talk about someone that knows the good, the bad, and the ugly besides God, right? Because they're living your life with you. So they're there for things that you do. <laughs> And they still love you unconditionally because that's their job and because they chose to. So you have a being there besides our divine creator that also loves you unconditionally no matter what. You know, no matter what. Which is kind of cool because sometimes you get, that you get in that lonely place. And I know I've been there here and there for the last few months. Nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. That's not true. But you get into those little moments of pity party despair because something's not going your way or whatever. And uh, it's real easy to forget. And then your angel can come and, you know, drop a song idea on your head or something that's just perfect. Or a friend will call. You know, and I think sometimes when our friends are uh, listening to their angels and listening to, you know, spirit, they can also be the voice of an angel. And I remember having a dream once because I was curious if angels sit and gossip about us. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> so I went to bed. I don't know why. It just popped in my head. But right before I went to sleep, I was like, do you guys talk about us? Like when we're sitting and doing our thing like in church or somewhere or whatever, do you guys like hang around above us and like, or like, you know, like the little, I always picture it kind of like their little dispenser of light and they're getting their little refill and they're talking around the, <laughs> they're talking around the light cooler and, and <laughs> like, oh my God, did you see what Robbie did today? I can't believe she did that. Well, I told you to tell her this. You know, that's what I think, right? That maybe <laughs> they stand there and do that. So I went to bed thinking about it and they do. They really do. They help each other help us, and they are all very interested in seeing us succeed in our lives because they love us, and it's part of their duty and job as angels, right? And so they are interested, and they do talk. And um, I remember I woke up from the dream. They were just kind of like hanging out, sitting up there in my dream, just talking, Pointing. And then they were boasting about a few people. I don't remember who they were, but oh yeah, did you see what she did yesterday? It was so cool. You know, that type of thing because they get excited for us too, kind of like parents with kids and things. So angels are really, really um, interesting creatures to say the least. So 
how do we interact with them and talk to them? I get that a lot. I get people, they ask me that a lot. I tried to do this and um, I didn't get anything. I didn't feel nothing. And I was like, well, first of all, you gotta be patient because it took me like years. Now I'm not saying that's gonna happen with everybody, but you gotta be patient because they're not going to interact with you and talk with you before you're ready. And there's times when we think we're ready, but then you have the experience and you're not. You know, and um, I remember my daughter not too long ago was telling me, Mom, since you've been talking about angels, I periodically smell lilacs. This is about three years ago. I'm like, lilacs? She's like, yeah. I go, well, have you been wanting to talk to your angel? She's like, no, I didn't even ask. But there's just certain times when I smell this smell. Well, I didn't think about it. And we went further on. Uh, with our lives and, and days and things. And she went to prom and uh, went to an after party. You know, those are always so popular. And of course, a lot of the kids were underage drinking and things. And um, she's more kind of like the mother hen of the group, like watching over her friends and everybody. They tease her. She did uh, the lead role in Mamma Mia last year. And everybody was like, that's so perfect because she was the mom. I'm like, that's so perfect for you, you know, because she is somewhat of a wise, wiser uh, soul, I think. And so she started smelling that lilac smell. And she thought, hmm, I keep smelling that smell. And then she kept getting in her mind, leave, just the word leave, leave. And she was like, and then she knew and heard my, my teaching and things. So she thought, well, I wonder if this is my angel. So she went to a couple of her friends and she's like, we gotta go. And they're like, what? <laughs> you know, the party is just starting. She's like, no, I really, really feel like we need to go. So her friends trusted her because she helped many of them through things and whatever. So they're like, okay, fine, we'll go. Where are we gonna go? And Danae was like, I don't know. <laughs> I was just supposed to leave. But the front door, kids were partying and everything or whatever. So she, again, she got back door. So they went, went back door of the house, left. It's about 10.30. They're walking, and this is out in county. So they're walking through a field, and she has her little flashlight, and they're getting back to the car. And five minutes later, the police show up. And a ton of kids got, like, in a lot of trouble <laughs> for drinking and citations. So she's like, Mom, I would have been in a lot of trouble because I was right there with everybody. And I said, yeah, you would have. You'd probably been grounded, too. So it's a good thing that <laughs> your angel stepped in. So she started paying more and more attention to that and would notice more and more, the more patient she was and the more that she started trying to talk to her angel, it would engage her. And then suddenly it had, she had a name and I'll get to that. Names are important. And um, we went to Santa Fe this last summer and we went through the churches. Have any of you been to some of those churches there? They're really beautiful, some of those old Catholic churches or whatever. And she was just da na 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 yapping, yapping, yapping. And she's like me. She talks a lot when she's comfortable or she's shy until she gets to know somebody. And I'm trying to, like, you know, I'm in there, and I'm like, oh, wow. And I'm trying to have, like, this little experience, and she's neat, 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 neat. And suddenly, and I'm like, please, help me. <laughs> That's all I said, quietly. And then she got silent. And the whole rest of the time, she was just like really silent and contemplative and everything. So, and I tell her little things here and there, and I teach her a little bit here and there about Catholic things, because I didn't raise my children Catholic. And um, we left the church, and she was like, did you smell the smell in there? And I was like, what smell? The lilacs, mom. The lilacs. And I go, oh, yeah, I asked your angel to shut you up. And she was just like, what? <laughs> so, like, I kind of have fun like that, and you can do that too. So be patient. And another thing is great. You like, like really good help on some of those things there. But the next thing you want to do is meditate. You know, take the question, hey, I want to meet you. And just meditate. And you know what? It's okay to use your imagination. When I first started, I would do those songs. Like there's that one song. Um, it's called I See the Lord. And it does the whole Isaiah verse where he sees him in the temple and the angel comes and puts the coal and all that. So I used certain songs that would help me start to visualize. And then you just let your imagination take off with you. And then when you're done, you can go and you can 
journal. I'm big on journaling. Journal your experience. You can go back. Because I've gone back to some of my first angel experiences to now, and I'm just like, wow, talk about the evolution of it, you know? Um, and just take time to just go in and try and meet them. And um, before we leave today, I'll give you a quick little meditation you can do. It's real simple on how to meet them and talk to them. And if you already talk and interact with your, your guardian angel, but say you want to interact with some of the other angels, then just start inviting them, asking them, you know? Um, listen. Once you've gone inside, ask them to show themselves, whatever. Listen and pay attention because they have different ways that will work for you to contact you. Like for my daughter, she's big on smells. She loves candles. She loves, you know, sometimes it's overwhelming. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> that smell, not so much. <laughs> but she just, so for hers, the smell is what gets her attention, that her angel's around. Other people, it's numbers. You have some real logical people that they just, you know, they start seeing synchronicities in numbers, and we all know numbers have meanings, right? So you're going through a tough time or something, or you're wanting to have some clarification in something you're going through, and suddenly, you know, you may ask, hey, help me, and suddenly you start seeing 1111 everywhere. And some of us that are a little slower on the uptake, it takes a little while for us to realize, hey, that could be something divine. And those of us who are a little more aware might be like, hey, you know, that could be something divine. So you can have your breakthrough either a week from the moment you ask the question or six months, depending on how much you're paying attention. Other things, smells, um, thoughts. Sometimes just a thought will drop in your head. And I've learned through the different experiences that I have that I can tell the different energies. Like I know divine God energy. I know spirit I know Jesus, like all those energies I know. And, I, and each angel has its own personality and its own energy. And there's some that are very stern and they just get in, get the job done, and they're out because they're busy. And those others, they'll mess around with you, they'll talk with you, whatever. And I remember I had gone to a class, uh, it was probably about a year and a half ago, to learn some more things about angels and healing with angels and things. And I remember um, we had done a meditation to meet our angel that would help us heal, that we could call on for healing people and helping people, right? And there was an individual there who'd been through a very, very rough time. And he, you know, everyone was sharing their experience and he said, well, his angel is Yeshua. And I was like, Jesus? Right. You know, because I was still in my teetering skeptical when I was going and learning different teachings from people as well because I was coming out of that, you know, religious mindset. And so I kind of scoffed, you know, and thought, right, your, your name, your, your angel's name, your, you know. <laughs> and so, wouldn't you know, I got paired up with him in the practice group. So it's him, myself, and another person. And one person, of course, was to sit and, you know, be uh, healed while the other person was doing the healing with their help of their angel. And then the third person was just there to keep the space and to keep it, you know, um, so that the healing could take place. And I was just kind of standing there and I was like, <sighs> you know, and uh, he put his hands on her shoulders and started to talk and pray and invite Yeshua. And the moment... He said that I felt Jesus' presence. And I was like, opening my eye, I was like, oh, hmm, you know? And very distinctly was told, who was I to judge someone else's experience? And that I'm not God. <laughs> and I don't know what he needs. And that Jesus will meet him wherever he needs to be met, and if he needed to be an angel, then by golly, he was going to be an angel. Wow, that shut me up. So, I don't ever discount anyone's experiences because it is real and true to that person and that individual, and we all have our truth, and we all have our spiritual walk that we're doing, and we all have our relationships and experiences with our angels, our guides, ancestors, you know, um, that come and talk to us. I mean, there's, there's something to be said about some of these cultures that still, you know, 
talk to their ancestors. You know, you've got the Day of the Dead, you've got some of these other things going on. It's because they're honoring them because they know they're in a higher plane and they can still come and help. And that's um, where the angels are too. So um, also dreams. They frequent our dreams because that's when we are the most receptive. Because everything else is shut off and our brains are like sponges. You know, and I mean, even in some of our Bible stories we have, right, where Joseph, father of Jesus, is sleeping and he has a dream from an angel that says, you got to take the baby, like now. Get him out. They're coming, they're coming to kill him, right? So they show up in dreams because we tend to just be more receptive and we tend to listen better. And in dreams... In my mind, I'm thinking that's like one of our portals to the spirit world, because anything pretty much goes. You know, I mean, I've had dreams where I was flying. I had dreams where, you know, I could change into different things. And then I've had dreams that were just so weird and out there that I was like, that was so not a dream. <laughs> Maybe some kind of vision or something. So those especially you want to pay attention to. Um, that way you can... Uh, start documenting and getting to know your angel. Now, the name. Most of the angels will eventually give you their name. There's something about the name that is very powerful. When you know their name, you can command them specifically for certain things, and they will do it. So my guardian angel has still not given me his name because apparently I'm irresponsible. And so he's... <laughs> no, he says I just have too much power and don't know, you know... Uh, I'm still learning. So I just call him Brad. And he seems fine with it. But many of my other angels have told me their name. No big deal. Because they're only one specific thing. Right? Dancing. Or whatever. So I can specifically call that particular angel. And they'll come. Boom. And there you go. So when your angel gives you your name, that is like really cool. And you want to be very, very careful not to share it with other people. It's for you and your angel unless you have that permission. Because it's very important to them. Their names are very distinct because they are who they are. It, enco it encompasses their energy when you have their name. Now, one more question before we uh, go into the meditation on where to meet your angel and how. Um, I always get the question, and I myself have been, I've wondered, why don't they always protect? Why? And the reason I say that is because there's a story when I was a child where one and a half in Italy, four stories high, my mom's letting me walk back and forth on the little ledge there, you know, because where am I going to go? You know, there's bars and things. Phone rings. She goes in to grab it real quick, comes back to the porch. Guess what? No baby. I'm not there. So she walks out on the ledge and she's freaking out and she hears this man yelling to her in Italian, calling her many, many names <laughs> and not happy. And she looks over and I am on the other side of the ledge, holding on and giggling and laughing to something. She doesn't know. Well, she was too short and small to just reach over and get me and she couldn't pull me through. So she had to go in and get my dad who was in the shower because that's usually when things happen. You know, when you're in the shower or whatever, you got soap all over and she's screaming at him to come and get me, right? So here he's trying to get out of the shower, yells at her. She left me alone again because she was 19. And the guy, you know, the gardener, I guess, had a something and he was trying to figure out where I was going to fall. It was at the bottom of the apartment complex. And my mom's telling me the story and I'm looking at her, you know, I'm older. I'm like, that didn't happen. She's like, oh, yes, it did. And my dad reached over, got me, pulled me out. And my mom told me, here's the thing. I always prayed for your angel to watch over you. And you were giggling and talking and laughing to somebody. Now, two weeks later, another baby had, was in their playpen on the ledge, apartment below, climbs up and over. Now, lands in bushes, but is hurt pretty bad. Why did that angel not stop that baby, right? So, 
I asked my angel if I could go back to that time and he was there and he was holding me up because there was something for my parents to learn and for me in that specific instance. And for the other baby, it was the same thing. There was pre-agreements, predestined. So sometimes they're told not to interfere because either you're learning something through the experience or you've agreed that someone else, you're gonna help someone else learn something through the experience. And in some instances, that's just your time to go. That's just how it is. And in a world that's like this, because they exist out of time, they see and know and understand. Now for the most part, we hear more and more stories about angels that stop violence and protect you know, people rather than those that don't. I mean, story after story, if you go online and you just put angel experiences or whatever, I mean, people just tell, you know, story after story. And we have so many here too. I mean, I think we even have one with Nick and driving his truck and, you know, an accident that got averted because he was like magically transported. You'll have to ask him about the story. It's pretty cool when he tells it because you're just like, what? That's so weird, you know? Because that's kind of stuff that you hear and see in movies, right? So they have their jobs too, and they have certain things that they have to abide by as well. So to me, that's the only way, thing that does make sense because we are people of free will too. So we have our free will all the way through and we have certain aspects. And there may be a time when we're just at a place where we're like, I'm done here. Don't save me. And they won't. So there is that. We have, you know, we have that free will. And I think that um, it's still hard because I would prefer the angels, you know, <laughs> always save everybody. And then we would never have things like 9-11 and things like that. But humans owning the planet like we own, we do things to hurt each other, you know, unfortunately. So you can always do a little more soul searching and get more information on that. But that's where I, you know, have seen things and heard stories and different things going on. So the meditation, really simple. You want to find a nice, quiet space, just where you would do your normal meditation, right? And gentle song, doesn't matter. It can be Christian worship song, it can be a meditation song, it can be just, you know, something that stirs you emotionally. And just, once you get your breathing done, begin to have one thought and intention to meet your angel. That's it. I just want to meet you. You can do a song that helps you with the imagination. You can do a song that, you know, doesn't. You might just get feelings. You may not even see it. You may just feel a different kind of energy. And just take time to do that. And I would say do it anywhere from once a week to every day if you could. And be patient and come out of it, you know. And eventually you'll start talking and meeting and then you'll get to a place where you're like, seriously, I'm good. <laughs> but it's real simple meditation and you just, you know, just really just think about them because they are there and they're very interested in you. And um, in some aspects, I think Babies still talk to their guardian angels. You know, you walk in a room. You ever walk in a room and babies are just talking and giggling and whatever, and you're like, who are they talking to? Because they are specifically looking somewhere. And you're like, what are they seeing? What is that? And it's the same thing if you go in somewhere and a baby gets scared or whatever, they're seeing something because you're coming, we're so fresh out of the spirit world as babies and infants, right? You still are sensitive to that and seeing that. So I always find that like really um, interesting and um, 
cool. So real, that's real simple meditation. This is a good season to do that. You know, um, if you want to interact with your guardian angel, do that. You can use that same meditation if you're wanting to, you know, uh, meet some other angels that are floating around you. Um, that's always a good one, too, to use for it. And uh, have fun. Have fun with it, because they're fun creatures. I mean, some of them not so much. There's like a handful where you're just like, okay, <laughs> thanks. But for the most part, they like to have fun with us. They enjoy creation. They enjoy humans. And uh, you can have a lot of fun and uh, enjoy meeting them. So thank you. And I just want to say, uh, Lord, thank you. Um, open eyes, open ears, those that want to know. And let them be blessed and touched this season. Namaste. Amen.